and thank you for joining me for Roundtable here on Telil Community Television. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and this week we're going around the Richmond Council table once again as we recap several recent items from the latest regular monthly meeting of Richmond Municipal Council. We're also going to have some analysis of these events from Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett. We're covering a wide range of topics this week, everything from fire departments to food banks, and everything from a senior survey project to whether speakers during Council's question periods should be able to extend their questions beyond the allotted time. But we're going to begin by taking a look at housing in the Strait region. The Strait Area Chamber of Commerce has reached out to Richmond Municipal Council and the Town of Port Hawkesbury to see about setting up a housing association that would take a look at local housing needs. This all comes as the councillor for District 3 in Richmond County, Melanie Sampson, is seeking some answers on behalf of a constituent who wants to set up affordable housing in the district. But we kick things off by taking a look at the recent request from the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce to set up a housing association involving Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury. So the chamber, uh, in the correspondence that you would have received, you'll see, has been um, working on a housing development uh, project for some time. It was a two-fold project. Um, one, one part was to look specifically at developments within the town of Port Hawkesbury itself. They partnered with the town on this project. But the second part was, is where it may have a potential impact for Richmond County, and it was related to the establishment of a regional not-for-profit housing association, the kind of association that can apply to programs that municipalities may not be eligible for, that you know we we may have in common with other other areas. Um, so, so basically, to put some dedicated resources uh, into helping with the housing crisis in our communities, particularly with regards, of course, to the affordable housing situation. Um, and so, you know, the request at this stage of the game, I believe, is to uh, is to get commitment from council to, uh, you know, to support the establishment of a regional uh, not-for-profit housing association. There is no financial re request that's come with this. Not to say there may be one in the future, <laughs> uh, should council determine it a priority uh, to invest in. But at this point, it is a it's a support in principle that I believe the chamber is looking for. Um, they have also recommended having a joint meeting of both councils uh, with the Chamber of Commerce Board and staff to report on kind of the progress and, and what the governance of that type, type of organization would look like. Um, and so, uh, so that's where the status of the request is at this point. Your thoughts on the idea of what they're pitching from the chamber level and the two councils working together? Yeah, no, I think this is a stellar idea, um, and I have been in support of it for a very long time. Um, you know, some time ago, the Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition, um, which I'm, I'm currently chairing, you know, had come, you know, with some information forward to Council about the need for a regional nonprofit association. This latest piece of work that's been completed by New Dawn for the Chamber outlines that need as well. We need a dedicated resource to work on a housing action plan for our communities. We know it's a, you know, and if it's a pressing in, uh, issue, especially on the affordable housing side. Um, there are particular differences between uh, the town's needs and the county's needs, but there are also some really, you know, clear similarities um, and ways that we could be working together. And I do firmly believe that if we work together on this, we'll be able to pack a bigger punch and make a bigger impact. Um, because really, at the end of the day, you know, we we share a lot of resources and uh, having, I think, the the brain power of both councils and both both staffs on this on this issue will be really helpful so you know kudos to the Chamber of Commerce for uh, for taking that leadership role and I, I think it's I, I think it's exciting to see the business community um, identifying housing as uh, part of one of the number one things it wants to work on in the coming years um, madam chair would you yes. like uh, staff to take that on and um, further add that uh, staff explore the options of when the joint meeting could take place yeah, that would be great. I know we had plans anyway for a joint council meeting, but illness mm -hmm. got in the way, and maybe that's something we can tag, tag on, on in the fall. Absolutely. Yeah, It'd but be I, a great add to that meeting. Yeah, and I know that the Chamber of Commerce's executive director, um, Tanya Felix, is very passionate about this, so I'm sure if staff reached out to her, that, that probably is their best next step. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, we, you know, I think Perfect. Yeah. John, no, that's great. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Later in that same council meeting, further proof arose that there's interest in affordable housing development in Richmond County. 
Here's District 3 Councilor Melanie Sampson relating some correspondence that she's received from a potential developer in her constituency. So I just had an email from a constituent who's just looking to, uh, um, uh, to do a project, of affordable housing project. Um, and just uh, in discussions with CMHC, you know, they had just talked about how some municipal units are providing some assistance for developers of affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting when I uh, had a look at the... Um, information that New Dawn had provided to the town of Port Hawkesbury, one of the things that they said that the town could do to help uh, um, uh, developers, it, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying the right words, but mm -hmm. would be to provide some uh, assistance like of in-kind pieces, right? Correct. So, you know, permitting costs, perhaps water and sewer connections or, you know, municipal, municipal tax assistance. So I'm not looking for council to decide whether or not we want to do that or not, because I think that we need to know what that looks like in other areas. So what I would just ask of council is that we would uh, provide direction to the staff to just ask them to maybe throw it out on the listserv, just do a little bit of research about what other municipal units are doing. And then mm -hmm. we would bring that, I think, to bylaw and policy, because that's the place for that mm -hmm. to work. But I do think, you know, it's certainly, it's it's a it's a provincial uh, um, priority. It's a priority of, of our council, mm -hmm. I think, to... to you know, increase some affordable housing uh, units in the area. And so, yeah, I, you know, yes, and just I, and to research it. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, we are constrained by the Municipal Government Act. So there are, some, you know, lots of things we can't do, unfortunately, but there may be some room right. in there and with water and utility, you know, it would be UARB constraints, right? But we, yeah. there may be some room for movement there. Yeah. So. I mean, if things are happening in other municipal yeah. units in the province, yes. then they know how it's done. So no yes. need to recreate the, the water wheel. Yeah. You know, exactly. Let's let's see what everybody else is, or if anybody's doing it and what it looks like. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, and just, you know, with that, I guess it would encourage members of the public, if you know of good examples that are happening in other areas, Yes. certainly reach out and share them with us because we, you know, we're always looking for solutions yeah. um, that we can implement within the constraints in which we operate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, it's a constant interest for us and it still continues to be one of the highest priority items that I hear back from the, mm -hmm. my constituents for sure. So, mm -hmm. And I think I'll, I'll just forward that email from the constituent along to you, Troy, because you may want to touch base because maybe he has a connection at CMHC who could also just exactly. help you with some of that information. Right. I feel like it's there. So yeah. I'll share his contact info. Perfect. With you. Your thoughts on the idea that there are people that want to set this up, but they need the help from different levels of government and even from people like the chamber to do it. Yeah, exactly. This is, you know, it's it's been some time since the Affordable Housing Commission had asked for submissions, uh, you know, on, on you know, people's ideas about resolving the, the issue with the, you know, the housing crisis in Nova Scotia. And I remember very clearly the submission from the coalition it looked like a road map. It was, you know, organizations on one side and, and different levels of housing on the other side and all of the different ways that we each have a role to play and the private sector is definitely a part of that. So whatever we can do within the financial constraints and the infrastructure constraints that we have ahead of us, I think we need to do. So it was uh, it was great to hear from Councillor Melanie that, you know, other other members of the public are looking for solutions as well. In the meantime, as the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce continues its drive to set up a new housing association involving Richmond County and Port Hawkesbury, the two municipalities are still heading up the Strait Richmond Housing Matters Coalition. Warden Amanda Mubberkett provided an update on the coalition's activities at the latest Committee of the Whole meeting of Richmond Municipal Council, which took place on June the 12th. You'll notice on the report a May 10th Housing Matters, Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition meeting was held. Um, we held that in Lewisdale, right, you know, in, within our county. Um, it was our first in-person in session since COVID began and was really a, a day designed to, to re-energize our activities. And I just wanted to say publicly a thank you to Cheryl McDaniel and Rowan Hart for helping in the planning of that and all of the people who attended. Um, it included, uh, included specially made muffins for each one of the <laughs> attendees of the session. People on fixed incomes in Richmond County had another reason to be interested in the goings-on of the June 26th regular council meeting in Arishat. Food banks repeatedly hit the table as a discussion topic, not just because there were several funding requests from food bank associations around the county, 
but because in the public gallery of the Richmond Municipal Building in Arishat, several volunteers from the Isle Madame Food Bank were looking for council's support in terms of a potential relocation of the Isle Madame Food Bank. It's currently sitting in the former Immaculate Conception Church, which now serves in West Arishat as the Stella Maris Pastoral Offices, but the organizers are hoping to be able to find a new permanent home for the food bank, and they'd like to see if they could get council's help. The timing is probably getting pretty, you know, pretty um, urgent on it. Um, it. You know, I think Jacqueline did a great job in the message about outlining the um, the need um, and the seeing that the client clientele is continuing to grow and that they've uh, outgrown their current space. So. Um, the, the request that came through in the letter is to, for council to request the, um, the support of its members in exploring uh, possible currently vacate, vacant or suitable locations in the county. So they're looking for staff support. We're in a location that is only guaranteed on a year by year basis. And right. So like we, every year we have to request that we can continue to keep that space. Uh, we'd like a space that's more permanent. We've heard of other food banks where businesses have gotten together to uh, fund a permanent location. Okay. So um, in a, in a vacant building. Okay. Uh, which would be ideal for us. It would keep our costs down, but we'd also be open to um, any vacant locations that would provide that um, that respect and dignity to our clientele and sort of um, access be accessible in multiple different ways as well. Okay. So we've we've talked to business owners in the area so far, a few of them, and um, I haven't come up with anything yet. So we're just seeking advice from council as to what right. some of our options might be or things that we might explore, um, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Maybe what we could do is um, just kind of refer this to an off, you know, offline discussion uh, with the staff and a few Councillors, if, if there's interest, I would certainly be interested in trying to support your efforts. Yeah, I mean, like after reading the correspondence, I did make a few calls as well. So I have a few people kind of think, I mean, yeah. I, I don't live on Almadam anymore, but still have some connections, so just made some calls. Um, I'm just wondering if it would be appropriate if we put like a post on our right. social media saying, you know, if, if you know of a space or that you could reach out to the food bank, like even that, because we would have a pretty wide range of people who would follow our social yeah. media. I don't if that's appropriate, I would support that as an yeah. option just to try to help them yeah. connect. I, I follow what you're saying is that you may not yeah. realize what spaces are available. Yeah. Yeah, and it would have to be on Almadam. It would have to be on Almadam. Yes. No, no, I understand sure. yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, but we yeah, yeah, we would say that within we would say that in the post, right? Yeah. So perhaps we could kind of refer this back to staff um, to work with your group to figure out a way that we can try to support identifying a location mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. I just hesitate to put anything really specific. Um, as a motion at this stage I of the agree. game, because you may decide it's not appropriate for you know for that to be an emotion on public record. So um, yeah. just respecting the you know like you say the dignity of your clientele, etc. So we can take direction without the motion. Yeah, not Great. a problem. Yeah, well we could still do the motion I think, and then a little land in our action items. But sure. we'll just we'll, the motion would be to refer the matter back to staff to work with the. You know, to mm -hmm. work with the, the awareness. Yeah, food bank society and sure. and uh, potentially bring a report back to council. Would folks be supportive of that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay. Great. Councillor Melanie Sampson has made the motion. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Seconded by Councillor Mike Digden. Any further discussion on that item? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. In addition to the request from the Isle Madame Food Bank Society, Richmond Municipal Councillors also dealt with a grant request from the Lewisdale Food Bank Society. Now you'll notice that as Deputy Warden Brent Sampson brings this issue up from the Committee of the Whole report that took place on Monday evening, Councillor Melanie Sampson is absent from the discussion as she declared a conflict of interest shortly before the Lewisdale Food Bank Society's grant request came up. The committee discussed the grant request from the Lewisdale and Area Food Bank Society for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds in the amount of $5,000. I move that Council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to approve the grant request from the Lewisdale and Area Food Bank Society for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds in the amount of $5,000 and be allocated from the Regional Grant Funds. I'll second that motion. 
Thank you, Councillor Digden. Any further discussion on that item? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. With the recent wildfires in Shelburne County and parts of the Halifax Regional Municipality still fresh in many of our minds, Richmond officials are wondering what they should be doing to prepare for such events if they were ever to happen in the county. And they're also getting funding requests from folks like the Strait Area Mutual Aid Association and from the Loch Lomond Volunteer Fire Department. We're going to discuss those items in just a moment, but we're also going to take a look in this particular segment at a recent complaint raised by the Isle Madame Volunteer Fire Department regarding property owners who have excess brush in their fields. Here's how Richmond Municipal Council decided to deal with it when the issue came up for discussion on the June 26th evening of Richmond's latest regular council meeting. The committee discussed the correspondence from the Isle Madame Volunteer Fire Department regarding piles of brush left in fields. I move that Council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to have staff draft a letter to the Isle Madame Volunteer Fire Department to outline the limitations to private property. The only thing I would add to that, well, not to the motion, but just for uh, information purposes, is that uh, DNR, DNRR actually has something in place for cleaning up brush and whatever, and this. With okay. speaking with Stuart out in Rocky Bay, it was uh, okay. So, we anybody can do an inquiry into with DNR to outline in the letter as well? Is that what you're Yeah, saying? I would I would reach out to them. I do know a gentleman out there had an issue with fallen trees in his backyard and whatever, and then he approached Stuart from DNR, and there is something out there through them. So, okay. again, what it is, I'm not sure, but yeah, just hmm. food, food for thought, and maybe some content we could include in the letter if that's the case. Yeah. Great. If there is a program available for people, maybe if um, if staff's able to find that, we could post that to the website as well, because yeah, I'm sure it would be sure. great for a lot of residents to yeah. have We did post the uh, fire smart stuff already today, yeah. so, and okay. responded to the letter, but yeah, if we find any programs, by great. all means, we'll make it yeah. part of our public awareness. Fantastic. Look, lots of folks are concerned, especially after the, you know, the forest fires that we've had here in the province. Um, it's been, you know, slightly terrifying, um, and, that, you know, for, for a lot of people to know that, especially with the hurricanes that we've had, there's a lot of deadwood down. We still see impact in our forests from the spruce budworm many, many years ago, right? So, so we know that there's a lot of deadwood. We know it's concerning. At the end of the day, the municipal government um, can only do so much and certainly would not have the authority to, you know, to clear uh, private lands but at the same time there are some resources that we can share and we've done that with the Alma Dam Vol uh, Volunteer Fire Department. Really admire them for bringing it forward because I think you know it'll help raise awareness for people to maybe take a look at their properties and if there is some cleanup that could be done um, then that would be great and you know we've heard about some potential support from natural resources and renewables so um, just a really good reminder about the danger that that can pose to our communities right and and hopefully you know together we can find some solutions but at the end of the day we will be looking to private landowners to to deal with their own private lands um, but at the same time if there's anything we can do to support the efforts of our fire departments we definitely want to do that as well. You referenced the HRM and Shelburne County wildfires Concern coming out of HRM was that Tantallon only has one road in and out that can be used as an evacuation road in a situation like this. Do you have similar concerns for Richmond County or even for parts of Richmond County? Uh, are you and EMO talking a little bit about things like this, given what happened uh, on the mainland earlier this month? Yeah, no, sure. We, you know, we definitely have concerns about that in Richmond County. There are areas of our of our county that are, you know, especially those areas that are extremely rural. There is one road in and one road out. So these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about. And we're really fortunate right now uh, to have someone as qualified as Steve in the role of EM, you know, EMC, because he and the CAO, I know, are working hand in hand to uh, to try to do, you know, do whatever is possible to prevent any kind of uh, disaster in the future but uh, and also to be prepared to respond should something like that occur so definitely top of mind in addition to the brush issue volunteer fire departments and emergency responders came up on two more occasions during monday's regular council meeting in arishat first of all here's deputy warden and district 5 councillor brent sampson introducing a request from the straight area mutual aid association that's designed to help them with equipment purchases the committee discussed the grant request from the Strait Area Mutual Aid Association for the Type 1 Infrastructure Grant Funds in the amount of $5,000. 
I move that Council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to have staff reach out to the proponent to gather more information on what other municipalities have granted funding and further move that Council have the Emergency Services Coordinator provide a staff report for the next meeting. So are folks supportive of the um, request for $5,000? I'm willing to make that motion. I felt much more comfortable with it based on the information we received back oh. um, regarding the asks to other municipalities as well and so on. And, yeah. And it looks like they're pretty close to getting there. So. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. They, they've already had yeses from yeah. four, I think. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So. Yeah. Absolutely, I would support it as well. Yeah, yeah. and certainly the letter from our emergency services coordinator holds a lot of weight with, with you know, from, from my perspective as well, so I'd be supportive of that, so. Yeah. Okay, so we have the motion made by Councillor Digden. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Any further discussion on that item? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. Also coming up for discussion at the June 26th regular monthly meeting of Richmond Municipal Council, a funding request from the Lock Loman Volunteer Fire Department. We're going to share this discussion with you here on Roundtable in its entirety so you can get a sense of why fire departments in communities around Richmond County are making funding requests to try to provide greater comfort to the residents they serve during such times as major storms, fire emergencies, and other areas where people need shelter. And we're also sharing the footage with you so you get a sense of how municipal councillors deal with these issues when they come before the municipality. From the Lock Lomond Fire Department, this is for a Type 1 infrastructure grant fund in the amount of $5,000. Um, so they are seeking, they're seeking that amount of investment. Um, I, my understanding is over and above the levy costs. I checked in with the CFO today on this. So it's not for the roof on the fire hall itself. It's on the community center adjacent mm -hmm. to the fire hall. Um, they recently took that over, whereas previously it was under... Uh, Lock Lomond Heritage Association. Um, so they're in charge of the building now. Their uh, their issue is they um, they have, well obviously they have an issue with the roof and mm -hmm. they'd like to have this set up as um, a comfort center and right. so on and that. But they said you know with the roof being what it is, none of the other pieces matter if that's right. not. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking this is kind of akin to like in St. George's Channel where they had a roof project or mm -hmm. and there was one right over here as well, um, whereas it's not on the fire department building itself, even though they are the controlling uh, entity there. When I looked at their budget, their plan to fund the balance of the, was just gonna come out of their savings account. Am I remembering that properly? Yeah, because it looks like their expenses this year are a little bit above their income by a few thousand with their budget. Yeah, and they don't have a lot of cushion there right so no. I was so we could do a motion conditional on that you know them uh, on on the, the organization um, providing us with some evidence that they have the capacity to complete the project is that I think that's the concern you're getting to counselor in the past we've done you know for example st. George's Channel they yeah. didn't have the financial capacity to do it we made their grant conditional on them getting approval through other government agencies for that's the right parts yeah. because we we're concerned about them having the ability to raise the rest of the money. Right. That's right. Yeah. And then they did a, they had applied for money, they were approved, and then that sort of kicked Triggered in our, that our grant was going to, for lack of a better word, stick. Yeah. And then, since then, they've, yeah. they've done the project. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I didn't see that as part of their, as part of their application. And, and we don't need to make that contingent on no. external support. It no. could be internal support I that agree. they could bring to bear. You know? uh, yeah, and I'm not sure that that's, I think it's just that their budget for this upcoming year ends up in a bit of a deficit based okay. on this. I'm not sure that they can't uh, fund the project. Do you know what I mean? Like they, I think they mm -hmm. had a Like in terms of retained earnings, they would have. Yeah, to exactly. If, uh, if we look at tw April 1st, 2022 to March, 31st, 2023. Yeah, it yeah. says third, but I'm assuming it's 31st. Um, there was a balance in yes. the check. Yeah, right? they have like four, you know, they do have, yeah. uh, they yeah. do have money there. And, yeah. and yes. again, I, I think I'm, I think I'm fine with that. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't miss something there in terms sure. of where the rest of the money. Yeah. Yeah. But your motion would be to support the uh, grant request from the Loch Lomond Volunteer Fire Department in the amount of $5,000 allocated 
with $1,000 from the District 5 fund and 4000 from the regional fund. Correct. So I'm more than happy to support a great yes. project. Yeah, it's a great project. <laughs> it I mean, and, and the purpose of it, you know, to yeah. make a good comfort center is yeah. Yeah. no brainer. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. And now we'd like to share some discussions that came from the June 26th regular council meeting of Richmond County concerning two very different funding requests from the community of River Bourgeois. We think our Telil viewers might be interested in taking a closer look at these discussions because they deal with what exactly is appropriate in terms of a funding request for Richmond Council, and in the case of this first discussion involving the River Bourgeois Mariner Society, whether Richmond Council should be more active in helping events that take place every year get relaunched following the difficult periods of the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's take a look at the request from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society right now. The committee discussed the grant request from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds in the amount of $1,500. I move that Council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to approve the River Bourgeois Mariner Society grant request for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds in the amount of $1,000 and be allocated as follows, 500 from District 4, 500 from Regional Funds. So I think at this stage of the game, um, yes, as I recall, it, no, it was sent to Jason, it was sent to our CFO, I'm sure, because there was discussion around, he had discussion with uh, the applicant, Sherry Backerdax, about, have um, you have it there? Yeah. It was, it was related to expenses that are not kind of allocated into the, into the overall cost framework for the event, right? Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Provide? Sure. May, I'll, I, yeah. I have the email here, so maybe yeah. if you'll indulge, indulge, I'll just share. It's it's yeah. fairly short. Uh, it was just sent to the warden, myself, and uh, the CAO, so that's why you didn't see it. Um, and basically, the, the I had just asked a question, just to give a bit of context, I just asked a question about the poker run expenses because this funding is is to be used for that purpose. And she, she just said that the board of directors wanted her to further break down the poker run expenses rather than just lumping them all into one line like she had originally planned. Um, and so some things like, for example, porta potties for the run were just posted under septic services were all, uh, and some things were under office supplies. So when we looked at the financials, it looked like the poker right. run expenses were low, but in fact, they were distributed throughout the financials. Um, and so she said she did appreciate the confusion and question and welcome the opportunity to explain it. Um, and so she did say that um, if we were satisfied with that answer, if there would be any consideration to approve the grant uh, at 1500 as opposed to the 1000 uh, and she said that the grant uh, in 2022 was approved at 50 she just reminded of, of us of the amount from yeah. the prior year 1500 that's right okay. um, and at that time this um, the CFO did um, tell her that the motion was ready in the report for a thousand dollars and that it would be at our discretion in terms of whether or not we wanted to amend the motion um, to bring it to 1500 or not if there was interest from council in doing that, I would incre I would suggest it be increased from the regional funds. I just know yes. that there are going to be a lot of demands on the district for funds yeah. with yeah. festivals and whatnot coming up. So, um, but but I would kind of leave that open for discussion if folks would like to do a change or if um, or if yeah, you're satisfied uh, with the motion. I, I think I'm comfortable with the uh, explanation that uh, she provided. Mm -hmm. It would have been nicer to have it, you know, I guess prior. But uh, in saying that, then. Yeah, I, I would make the motion to, I guess, adjust the ask, or not adjust, to increase the amount that council mm -hmm. approved at 1000 to 1500 using 1000 out of the um, regional fund and the 500 out of the uh, district four. I mean, the original discussion, I think, at the time involved both the representation of the prior year's expenses, but it also involved discussion over us funding fundraising activities mm -hmm. and that it it does start to get into a little bit of a slippery slope and that um, at what point do fundraising activities cover their own expenses mm -hmm. um, and the feeling was that my feeling anyway was that um, in the past we had done it be because it, we were just coming out of COVID and it was time to uh, get things moving you know get these activities up and running again um, and I think I had mentioned at the time as well that I, f I felt it would be a good idea for us to, through policy, to think mm -hmm. a little bit about coming up with a policy that talked about 
restarting of events or new events and what how our support could look for that. So all of that being said, we that's not what our policy says. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I just wanted to, again, sort of reinforce that thought, but that I would be okay with the friendly amendment to move it to 1500 in the absence of any kind of policy work that that would, you know, yeah. go against that idea. But I do think that we, we okay. need to look at that uh, in the fall. Okay, yeah, I agree. I think we need to kind of hash that out. Um, I would have a little bit of a differing opinion, but I, I think there's probably a, you know, compromise we yeah. can figure out in the fall. So, um, uh, Deputy Warden, would you be uh, okay with the friendly amendment to that effect? I don't think so, only because um, I'm looking at this like a startup cost for an activity where we have a grant, I believe, is a type one. Oh, I believe. Could I be. Look it up. But anyway, and those max out at $500, and it kind of feels like this fits perfectly into that. And I, I don't blame them for applying under type four because the amount is higher. But I feel like when we have like say fundraising breakfasts or some kind of event, like fundraising events like that, um, generally they're applying for that type of assistance and it maxes out at $500. Mm -hmm. So just it, as much as it's, you know, I, I wanna support it, I don't know that I'd um, be willing to at, at that amount. Yeah. So it so from a policy perspective, like even at the thousand, we're in excess of, of that amount. Yeah, to that point, uh, and, and no offense, I hope is given, but if you're going to support a type one, if you're not going to support the type four because it's you don't feel it's in the right category, but you feel it should be under type one, then the support of the of the thousand and the type one was yeah, it's up in question anyway. Was up for question anyway. Mm -hmm. In the end, Council voted to raise the amount being granted to the River Bourgeois Mariner Society from $1,000 to $1,500, and they also voted in favor of providing funds to the Mariner Society in the first place. District 5 Councillor and Deputy Warden Brent Sampson voted against both the amendment and the original motion. And now we're going to show you the second Municipal Council discussion from the June 26 regular meeting that was sparked by a funding request from a River Bourgeois group, specifically the River Bourgeois Community Services Society. This time around, councillors are trying to figure out just how far they should go in providing funding for accessibility measures to an association that doesn't necessarily follow a regular budget process. Here's the conversation from the June 26 regular council meeting for Richmond County concerning the funding request from the River Bourgeois Community Services Society. The committee discussed the grant request from the River Bourgeois Community Services Society for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant Funds in the amount of $10,000. I move that council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to have staff reach out to the proponent for further information on the designated funds listed in the financials and further move that the decision be deferred to the June Council meeting. So this one, you'll recall, we were requiring some additional information on designated funds because it appears that the society is sitting on, you know, quite a bit of ass, you know, financial asset there and um, just wanted some clarity, I think, on the designated funds. And it does turn out that they are holding funds for um, a playground group uh, as well as some others. One of my concerns I had was just the... Um there was no budget provided for the upcoming year either. Um, I guess that was asked by the email trail, but they decided they didn't want to provide one because they hadn't in the past. I don't think they do an annual budget. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some, like I know and a lot of times when the grant requests come in, what we see is a project budget, not an right. organizational budget, right? And I think maybe at a policy level, we want to make some changes there um, to clarify what we're expecting from community groups mm -hmm. because many 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 organizations do not operate they, they don't they don't pass an annual budget you know um, especially those without staff so maybe i'll just mention i did have some kind of correspondence back and forth with uh, sharon chilvers the applicant and uh, you know i i definitely support the intent of the request and i know that the funds will be put to good use they're looking to um, replace flooring and i believe an entrance system and so i mean that would have an accessibility impact as well of course as any work they would do would have to meet that you know any new requirements um, you know the, the fact of the matter is that it's it is a represents a significant chunk of our um, of our grant funds and we know that things are picking up from a activity perspective um, at the same time you know we have you know we have invested as much as five uh, 5,000 in other grant projects this year. Uh, we haven't gone to the 10. 
We did have some examples of going to the 10,000 in previous years, but I think, it, you know, in part it was because we had some funds left over towards the end of the fiscal year and had the wherewithal financially to do that. Um, you know, the question could be asked if, if there's not an intent to provide, to fund at a $10,000 level, then why would we have that as an option in our policy? So it may be something we want, again, to tighten up from a policy perspective. Mm -hmm. when, when would we consider a circumstance ex exceptional enough that we would fund to that amount, right? I don't know that the doors would increase accessibility necessarily, right? I'm not sure well, they, they would have to be, I'm sure, right, to be, they'd have to meet a certain minimum code. No, but I think they're just a replacement of what's there, right? Like, do we know if they reached out if, for an accessibility grant or any of the... The, gra the grants are closed. No, I know. Yeah. But do we know if they reached I, out? They, I don't know. There, well, there is yeah. nothing under other funding sources, right? This is how yeah, you applied exactly. for... For other financial assistance. So that kind of tells the story on that question, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I no, would assume that's just a standard double door at that price from Coastal. Is it? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I was assuming, but I do think that's a question we probably want to get some clarity on. None of it seems to be, you know, automatic door openers or any oh, of yes. that. So I just I, meant with wise. With wise. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I, yes. and I believe they're replacing what's there because there is a double door down there now. From, okay. I'm yeah. pretty sure on the far end, on the far opposite end. the stairs. Yeah. I, I don't mean that it's not required, just that I don't know that it increases any accessibility. Mm -hmm. You know, they get some of their HST back. So the doors yeah. are something like forty five hundred dollars. The flooring, it like, the flooring is something like ten thousand. So the whole project is something like fifteen thousand. We've made a practice to. To, to not fund things greater than 50% exactly. again, whether we need to tighten our policy or not, perhaps. But yeah. the flooring's so, more than that. There's two different quotes for flooring. Yeah, but one, the way it's written, there are similar quotes, but one doesn't have the labor included. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing one here is 17000 before tax, and that's with the labor included. I think the other one that's quite a bit lower has yeah, the labor no as a labor. separate item. So, oh, yeah. okay. So the total. Oh, would yes, be, I see this here. Yes, okay. Yeah. So the ta the total is maybe more like 20,000. Uh, 20,000 just on the flooring. 20,200. Well, including tax, but they, Correct. they they get some of their tax exactly. back. Yeah. yeah. Even outside of that, like, I think we sort of set a, a bit of a precedence, if that's the word, in terms of like about $5,000 mm -hmm. for facility upgrades. Again, we. We just approved one for yeah. long, like we've done St. George Channel. We did yeah. another. We've done different plate, different halls, yeah. and that's what we've done. I mean, that's a number I'm comfortable with. But and ten thousand is just yeah. a lot from, you know, our general budget is only thirty nine thousand. We already have yeah. a chunk of it allocated. Ten thousand is going to basically tie our hands for that type four. Yeah, as we move into the fall and the winter. And they still have a substantial amount in yeah. their. Yeah. Yeah, they it's do have some financial capacity there. Yeah, for sure. And mm -hmm. I know, look, I know the Community Services Society provides an excellent service to to the River Bourgeois area and a lot of other community groups because they don't, you know, they're much like the Kingston Health Center, right? You yeah. you know, you have a group of people, they do they don't necessarily formalize into a society, and so you tend to run projects through yeah. through that organization and it's great work that they do. Mm -hmm. But if counselors are comfortable with an investment of $5,000, um, I would suggest a similar um, uh, situation as we just did for Loch Lomond, and I'd put 1,000 from the my district fund at, for District Four, and then 4,000 from regional if folks would be supportive of that. I would make a motion to that effect. Okay, thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Can I have a seconder on that item? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Dickton. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion is carried. Recently here on Talil Community Television, you've seen some interview footage and also some dramatizations of the interview process involved in the Acting Collectively Seniors Information Project. It's carried out by researchers from Dalhousie University, and it's also run by local coordinators and interviewers in Richmond County, Victoria County, and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Well, they're still trying to figure out how to get enough people to do the interview process before the project wraps up this coming fall. And Richmond Warden Amanda Mubriquette threw down the gauntlet for her fellow councillors earlier this month when she decided to challenge them to recruit people who could take part in the interview process for the Acting Collectively Seniors Research Initiative. 
Here is some footage from the June 12th Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Municipal Council in which Warden Mumbricket lays down her challenge. The recruitment of participants to do the research piece has been growing slowly. It is a, it is a bit of a, a marathon, not a sprint. Um, collectively in the three municipalities, they've completed a little over 120 assessments, which is just over a quarter of the project's initial recruitment goal. Um, as of June 1st, 59, uh, I think maybe now by today it's 60 older adults have completed an assessment in Richmond County. So that number is almost 37% of the original recruitment target that we had here for the county. Um, so could, just considering that one in, almost one in three uh, residents in Richmond County are 65 years and older, obviously some of the, you know, the outcomes here are to assist the older adults uh, who participate. Um, by providing them with individual care plans, uh, which will try to connect them to the resources that they need, but also to understand the gaps in services where, where they don't exist so that we can plan better as a municipality and so that we can advocate to the province and the federal government uh, for better services where gaps exist. So the challenge has been issued by the project team members to us um, as a council. The 555 recruitment campaign. They're asking five councillors over the next five weeks to find five people who would be willing to participate in the program um, and that will help them reach their quota by the fall and would ensure that they have people from all over Richmond County. So I will say this is something that's important is that we have a geographic dispersion um, on, on the assessments that are conducted so that we're not sort of only seeing data from one geographic location in the county. It'll give us a better picture. So I'm not going to ask for your commitment on the record right now, but I will ask you to consider the 555 recruitment campaign. Think about some older adults in your communities who may be, you know, good, you know, good examples of folks who could participate in this. Um, they're asking that we mention it to, you know, family members, friends, neighbors, and invite them to take part. And also, also to get their name and number and to send it along to Jennifer at the Kingston Center who is registering the participants and I have that contact information. So if anybody watching would like to participate, um, the number to call is 902-587-2800, extension 4. And uh, the, the person's name is Jennifer, and she'll take your call, and you can uh, learn more about the project. I already <laughs> recruited my parents for you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I was going to put five on the spot right now. Which is okay, five. well, you, you <laughs> get, get the names together and yeah. uh, talk to them about the project, there and um, then cool. uh, send their information along. That would be really great. I will say that one thing that the project is not doing is they're not doing blind calling or cold calling to you know older adults in our communities because you know at right from the outset we recognize that you know it's it's not a great way to get good response and it, and I think it makes people kind of concerned that it might be a scam right mm -hmm. and yeah. it, you know so just to assure the public this is not a scam if you hear from acting collectively it is a project that the county has been uh, has been uh, sponsoring I guess and, and and hopes hopes will give us some really good data it's really hard to get local data at a, at a very you know for rural areas about what's working and what's missing in our in communities so this is a really great opportunity I think it's also that. important to note, like when we had our presentation on acting collectively, Celeste had presented to us, mm -hmm. Celeste and a few others, and I know that at the time I just asked, you know, what could we do yes. to help, and and the comment was made, and I guess I would reinforce that that you know if you have an older adult in your life, but you they are maybe not able to necessarily answer all of the questions themselves, that you could sit with them yes. when the call happens and sort of help to interpret the questions and yes. interpret the answers, and so don't feel like if if you if if you have someone in your life who could uh, provide some really valuable insight that yeah. they shouldn't be participating, they're probably the group that needs participating the most because they are gonna. That's where we're gonna find the services that people really need. Absolutely, care providers or family members are welcome yeah. to be part of those interviews. Absolutely, yeah. Great point, counselor. Okay. Any further discussion on acting collectively? All right, I'll be following up with you at the end to see which five people you all referred. So, <laughs> twenty-five <keep> each. <laughs> five five each. weeks, five people. That's I was right. thinking it was five a week. Do you mean one a week? Oh yeah, I mean five a week. Yes, so last one love five a week. Right. <laughs> as many as you can, so we can reach the target in an appropriate amount of time would be great. We're going to wrap up this week's edition of Roundtable by taking a look at the difficulty in policing public question periods that take place during the regular meetings and Committee of the Whole meetings of Richmond Municipal Council. 
A recent question period at a May Committee of the Whole meeting ran 40 minutes long instead of the allotted 15 minutes. And that sparked some conversations among municipal councillors at the regular monthly meeting at the end of May, but also at the June 12th Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Council. So we're going to show you that Committee of the Whole discussion right now as it involves all five of Richmond's elected officials, as well as CAO Troy McCulloch. We're going to follow that up with a motion that was delivered by Deputy Warden Brent Sampson as part of the Committee of the Whole report that took place at Richmond Municipal Council's regular meeting, and we'll wrap things up with some commentary from Richmond Warden Amanda Mumbercat about the whole situation. So, here's the discussion about question period for Richmond Council meetings and how it should be rolled out. It's the second or third time that we've had, um, we've had, um, I guess, question period procedures either not being followed or just, you know, being interrupted we've had you know cell phones ringing we've had so i don't know it might be just something we want to uh engage the public in and you know let let the speaker know um and i hate to throw it at you madam warden but yeah. you're gonna have to come down with the hammer <laughs> um so let you know let the speaker or let the um whoever's sitting during question period um you know it might be one question and then the answer and then a follow-up question the only reason i brought it was because there was actually people at our last meeting that um, that's actually the whole session and didn't get a chance to ask a question. Right. And then drove, you know, almost 40 minutes to get back home. Okay. No, and you're right. So I know when we publish our agendas, um, we have some information about question period, but I'm wondering if maybe we could kind of refer this back to, for me and staff to maybe work together to have a couple of little bulleted lists that I, you know, that I could just kind of... Mm -hmm. Uh, reiterate at the beginning of each question period or yeah at the beginning of each question period to just remind people of the parameters and to let them know that we're going to stick to them in the interest of time and, and uh, sure we can work and, on that and I, I think I, you know I, I think we have to set parameters and, and again like I, I mentioned before we have to be a little bit flexible on yes, the you know if we have somebody traveling 45 minutes or an hour away to come to a meeting uh, I don't think that we can say you have two questions and then you're done for this evening, yeah. right? Like I or really a gallery do. full of people. But if we have a gallery full of people, then yeah. I think we have to be, you know. Yeah. Although I was absent the last meeting, I did watch the recording, so I did hear a lot of the, the discussions about it. And um, I just can't help but remember, you know, like previous councils, they would have like a sign-in sheet, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for people who wanted to speak. I, I don't know that I want to go there, but I'm just, my mind is thinking about like what solutions would be possible. Um, I've also seen uh, like timers, um, and so we have our question period set as 15 minutes. For the, but for the, for committee of the whole. Oh yeah, 15 or 10, 10 and 10, yeah. right. But, but you know, what, what if it was like five minutes a question, you, you know, and, and that includes the answer. So if you spend your whole time asking your question, you don't get much of an answer. And I don't, I don't necessarily love that, but I think that that builds in. <clears throat> that respect piece right so if you only had and if you had like a little stop walk clock right there that was turned we this way one. we have one yeah oh, but, but, but turn towards visible, the speaker yes. right <laughs> turns towards the speaker you know you're up click yeah right counting down your five minutes that's you know and then we could when they ask the question if it's respect you know you'd stop it you'd of answer course. the question obviously yeah. you wouldn't stick to it but i i'm again just wondering and so i guess to your point about asking if it would be okay if you and staff kind of come up with some solutions yeah. that can work there 100 percent, i'm yeah. fine with that but um, just some thoughts in terms of what those might Perfect. Well, maybe might we could circulate like. some draft points around. Yeah, and yeah. Then. But it, we do, I think, to your to your point, Councillor Dignan, we need to do something because yeah. it's not it's not okay. Well, right? and, and, you know, I think, as, you know, for phone for folks who phone in, for instance, yeah. making sure that they identify themselves yes. and, yes. you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's, these are things that yes. we need to, you know, we need to make sure we're doing to right, and I and I think these are things we need to make sure we're doing so that we protect question period and make sure that it's here to last yes. and it doesn't go away yeah. again. So right. that's kind of where where I'm coming from that with this. Yeah, and I I mean, you know, we are here to serve the people and the public. Yeah. Um, again, what my 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 process is, I hate to see somebody walk out that door that felt unserved. Right. So and that's what happened at our last meeting. There's okay. two people actually walked out that didn't get a chance to. Okay. I, I would say, Madam Chair, as well, don't forget that we do have a process for people to appear before council as well. Yeah, that is right. well documented on yeah. how they can do it and make sure if they have questions, yeah. they, they can have their time to mm -hmm. present to council. Mm -hmm. Nobody 
he is eliminated from that process, but there is a process yep. to be followed. Yep. And it does come with timelines and preparation so that we can properly prepare to hear it yep. and make sure you guys have the information so that if a decision is sought, you have time to ponder and consider options. Mm -hmm. So that process does exist for mm -hmm. the larger ones, but for small requests, and I get what yeah. you're saying, but there is also the one for larger. Yeah. And yeah. that's a part of the respect of other people rec recognizing we do have procedures that we need to follow mm -hmm. just so that you have time to consider what's being put in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, for me, I think our, our team should be very proud of the fact that we took back question period. I think we should be held accountable. We should be able to answer questions when our residents and, and our county ask mm -hmm. questions for us. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, like Councillor Digden said, I, I think that uh, you know there should be no gray areas. I think that you know you can gauge the room, and if the room is empty and the phone is not ringing and someone sits in that chair and they want to ask 15 questions in 15 minutes, they can go do so because mm -hmm. they got 15 minutes to do so. If the gallery is full and someone sits in that chair, I, uh, you know the the process uh, should be, uh, hello, my name is whoever. And my question to council is this. Mm -hmm. If it strays anywhere away from that, uh, we should correct that situation ASAP. But, yeah, and I would only add that, like what Councillor Deacon said originally, and this was my thought the other week, we talked about this, like one question and one follow-up question. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. sometimes yeah. based on the yeah, answer yeah. Right. they receive, that might trigger something else that, no, no. oh, mm -hmm. okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to clarify yeah. or whatever. Right. So, I, I like... I'm good with that kind of thing. I don't yeah. think I want to limit anybody to just one. No, no, no. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, like, like Councillor Dignan said, a question and a follow-up. So yeah. after the first question, it would be, yeah. my follow-up question is this. Right. Yeah. Again, if it strays from my follow-up question is this, uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, well, the we follow-up can be different if they want. I mean, yeah, no, no, but, but when you address council, mm. it should be, my first question is this. Yeah. And my follow-up question is this. And if it strays from that, then uh, we have to put our foot down, in my opinion. And when yeah. we say we, we mean Madam Ward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, I know. Well, she's the They're telling me just, to do a better job. I, no, I no, understand. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> no. Again, we just want to treat everybody the I exact know. same way. Right? So, I know. Uh, and I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. But it's, it's interesting. And look, it's a good problem to have that we have po you know, strong yes. public engagement. Yeah. And um, honestly, if we wouldn't have missed them two yeah. people, then... It would have yeah. been no harm, no foul, but there were two people who actually well, it, it did go quite over time as well, yes, it, it which is an issue. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. No, it sounds great. Um, we're, like, again, very lucky to have this as a, as a problem that we're, we're oh. dealing with because it means that people are engaged and they're doing the things that, <laughs> that they should be doing to help us grow our community, so it's awesome. I don't think we need a motion to any of this. You can just, um, it's up to you. I think I would like it in a motion just so that it makes the action list. Yeah. Um, and so maybe the motion could be to refer, um, you know, revision on question period procedures uh, to the warden and CAO. Sounds good. That'd be okay. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Mike Digden. <laughs> Can I have a seconder on that? I'll spend your money and give you work to Oh, yeah. She's not easy. Thank you, Deputy <laughs> Warden, for seconding that motion. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. That motion is carried. The committee discussed question period procedures. I move that Council accept the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole to refer the revision of the procedures for question period to the Warden and CAO. Has this been passed specifically to yourself and the CAO now to deal with this? How is that going to work? Yeah, exactly. So we will come up with some sort of mitigating and sort of practices, rule, you know, the, the, the rules of the road for question period. We really want it to be as useful to people as possible. If you're driving, especially from, you know, a, quite a distance away, we need to make sure that the best use of your time is made uh, when it comes to question period. We also have to balance that, though, with the best use of council's time. And as you saw with the extensive agenda we had tonight, you know, those committee of the whole meetings especially can tend to run really, really long. Um, and so we, you know, we do try to finish up respecting that everyone has, a, has a, you know, a, a work and a life that they that they also need to balance, right? So, um, you know, and, and like I said, it, it really, for us, the most the most critical piece is making sure that it remains a useful tool for members of the public to come in and get their questions answered.
All right, final question on this. Obviously, it falls to you as the chair of the meeting or whoever is chairing the meeting. Uh, you feel confident that because of the discussion you've had with the other councillors that you folks will be able to move forward on this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think we'll, we'll come back with a set of recommendations and uh, likely you'll see that in the fall and and uh, then we'll make a decision and go from there. And, you know, I think it's great that we're, we're sort of evolving uh, question period and some of our processes as we go along because... Our communities are changing, the issues in it are changing, and we need to be able to change with it, right? So, um, so it's you know it's never going to be perfect. If you think it's perfect, then you've probably got the wrong attitude. There's always room for improvement, right? So, uh, that's kind of been our uh, that's been kind of our approach since day one of being elected, and I think you'll probably see that continue for the long haul. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to my interview guests this week, Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen over the past hour here on Roundtable, or just some suggestions for a future edition of the show, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can use the email address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Halil Community Television directly with your thoughts and your suggestions. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. As always, you can follow Telil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and our YouTube channel features every single episode of Roundtable, including this one, as well as every single episode of our sister program, Talil 24-7, and complete coverage of the regular and Committee of the Whole meetings for Richmond Municipal Council. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.